I am just tickled pink to be here. Uh, it's a wonderful group of speakers, and it's been wonderful chatting with uh, several of you in the audience. Uh, they've got, uh, there's a lot, we are in terms of, you know, experience design, uh, we're at this wonderful threshold of discovering a whole, in a sense, a whole new, uh, a whole new country, uh, very much like the Columbus example that Dave just spoke about. And uh, it does, it does, yes, indeed, uh, involve games. And so that's what we're here to talk about, show you a little bit about my research. So essentially what I do is I am a player experience designer, and Zeo Design is the first player experience company. Um, I make games more fun. And I've run Zeo Design for the past 18 years. We've improved over 100 million player experiences for companies such as EA, Ubisoft, uh, Sega, uh, Play First, Leapfrog, Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon, all of these different companies. Um, and we've done that with, by working with amazing teams. We've worked on three of the Myth series. Uh, we've worked on uh, The Sims 2. We've worked on many of the, uh, the diner dashes coming out of Play First. And so uh, you know, with this, what we've done is we uh, take, so, take our clients to you know, that, next, uh, that next level of play. Where I started, sometimes it's helpful to know, is that uh, I have a degree, an undergraduate degree in cognitive psychology from Stanford. And essentially, I like to say I learned three things at Stanford. One is how people think, learn, and remember. I also learned how to make documentary films, which is how to get people to tell you their real story. And I learned how to program a computer. So I take these three things to take my clients to that next level of play. Here are some of the, uh, the companies. And uh, what I'm also, though, most known for is uh, the research that we've done called the Four Keys to Fun. And uh, what this is, is really defines uh, what, what I mean, at least, uh, about player ex by the term player experience. It's this, um, basically, it's the relationship between the interaction and emotions, basically the interactions that players make and the emotions that they feel. And this relationship is what creates the experiences uh, that players feel uh, during, during gameplay. And during good gameplay, it's, a, you know, it's, even, it's even better. We've applied this model to uh, even our own games. So through our sister company, Zeoplay, we have published a, a, a game uh, called Tilt. And uh, actually what I did is I took this model, the four keys to fun, with me to iPhone Dev Camp. And we actually teamed up with Joe Hewitt and I designed it, used it to invent a whole new type of game. It was the first game to use uh, the accelerometer uh, on Apple's platform. So it was the first iPhone accelerometer game. Uh, we only had two web pages and one YouTube video, and yet we were able to drive 250,000 visits, you know, from people coming to check us out. And so that shows you some of the power of uh, what the, some of the power of play can do. We now have a new version uh, called Tilt HD. It's on the iPad, and we're using that to tune. Uh, the game that we're actually going to release on the iPhone with, along with a metagame. And for those of you coming to my play shop tomorrow, we're going to talk a little bit more about that as well. Uh, here's the game here, and uh, it features Flip. And basically, Flip gets left all alone in the blighted ooze that was once Shady Glen, and Flip's too young to crawl, so you, the player, have to help control gravity and wind to uh, eat carbon out of the air and gather water and seeds to save Shady Glen. Uh, it should be noted that these, these, uh, these games, there are no buttons to play. All you do is you just tilt the controls. And we base that on what people, the, that action, that interaction, created an experience that people liked about the Apple platform to start with. And then we could extend that enjoyment into a game. That's what really helped make these, made these so popular. Uh, Tilt HD uh, was a f number one uh, app in 10, or a top 10 app in 10 countries uh, when we made it free on, on Earth Day. So it can be very popular. Uh, so what I'm here today to talk to you about is uh, how, to do, how to use emotion to uh, do your job of interaction design better. You know, not just add fun in a general sense, not just paint on badges or you know, do check-ins. You know, for too long, I really want you to rethink what we we've, what we've mean by interaction design. Because for too long, user intera interface uh, interaction design has focused on really serious sounding quality metrics and ignoring those that involve play. And yet play is integral to many things that we do as humans, and it's, vi it's really a vital ingre ingredient to learning. Uh, and our designs, your designs, our, all of our designs, create emotions every time the user interacts with them, whether we design those emotions or not. So again, we're on this watershed, this wonderful moment in history where we can discover this whole new terrain of human experience coming out of each individual uh, choice that people make. 
So I'd like to start, though, with my, where my fascination with emotion kind of came from, is I was uh, at the turn of this century. Uh, I found myself in Egypt. I was standing out on a temple, on the top of a temple in the middle of the desert, in Dandara, looking out of the desert. It was a hot, dry day, and my lips were parched. And I reached down for my canteen to get that last sip of water. When I stopped and stood in amazement, because there at my feet, someone had carved a game board. And I thought, wow, sort of two people had stood where I stood and thought to pass their time with the game. And I wondered, what would those people think of the, the games we play now? And then in the year, say, 2020, what kinds of experiences would, you know, would, did I want to play? So 20 years ahead, what kinds of experience would I want to play? And it was thinking about this that I realized that as a designer, everything that I knew would have to change because we had neither the tools nor the language to describe experience in any real deep form. And this was in, you know, the year, the year 2000, right? And we had, no, we had no way to measure those experiences, you know, with, with players. And so it was that, um, that, that initial response or that initial experience really shaped the way my research went. In a sense, I, I became, um, uh, you know, if you look at, um, uh, I became fascinated, like Newton watching apples fall, this invisible pull emotion has on human action. Take, for example, any group of, um, you know, uh, you know, any group of kids at play. You know, in the games that I was designing for my clients, I had thousands of rules, and yet they were lucky if they produced three emotions. Yet, looking at any group of kids at play, you see the entire pantheon of human emotion coming from a game with a single rule. Tag, you're it. Wow, can we do that? Imagine yourself in the year 2020, whatever kinds of experience, whether they're game experiences or, you know, accounting experiences or, you know, quilt knitting experiences. What in 2020, what kind of experiences do you want to unlock for yourselves as well as the people your, your software serves? And there's a potential if we do, do our, if we will collaborate and if we do our job right, we could actually unlock human potential of six billion people you know, around the world working together to improve quality of life through play. And so that's what I mean, you know, by the future of user experiences play. Because if you go to the average workspace, which I love Dave's example um, of, the, of the cubicles, uh, and basically if that were a zoo, you know, the humane society would protest. The environment and tools are so ill-suited to the task at hand, you know, the work that needs to be done. Uh, you know, the, um, the cognitive processes and the emotional process is just really ill-designed. Ill and that's the reason why so many escape to Facebook and Twitter and Farmville and Solitaire during the work, during the workday. Um, essentially, the, uh, you know, boredom is created through repetition and lack of interest. And, you know, why, if you think about it, why are water coolers so popular? Well, it's because the tasks, there's very little social interaction in the tasks. That's why people are hanging out at the water cooler. Why do we need coffee? Well, there's a lack of challenge and reward system in ma to mastering, you know, ma mastering something difficult you know, baked into the task itself. And this is what game design can teach us. It's not that we need to oversimplify the world in order to make life better. We need to recognize that human beings are complex pattern matching, creating machines, right? We, we are systems. And we need the stimuli and the challenges and the structure to accomplish new goals continually, again and again and again, something new, something new, something new. And our work environment and the way that we structure all needs to, all needs to, take, uh, all needs to factor, factor that in. It's not just any type of fun that we're going to apply. Uh, you know, we wanted specific activities um, that improve, improve life. And so if we think about, if we look at games and other types of user experiences, is that there really is something missing in the practice. You know, cognition, if we're designing interactions, cognition is only half the story. There's something else that's missing. If we look at players, what makes them, what makes them have fun, what, what they enjoy the most, there's some other systems involved than, you know, usability, time on task, heuristics, uh, you know, th that, that sort of thing. Uh, that's only a piece of what was going on. And it's ironic that since 1850, since 1848, in the case of Phineas Gage, we've known that choice, in choice, emotion, 
um, is the silent partner, is cognition's silent partner in every decision that we make. Every decision you've made in your life has been made on an emotional level first. And if you don't have, if you have damage to your emotional system, you actually can't make a choice itself. You could rationally describe it and even the consequences, but you can't actually make the choice itself. So we as interaction designers, as user experience experts, we've got to recognize the importance of emotion in our, in our games or in our, in, our, in our software, in our interfaces. So really it's all about experience design. I like to think of it as two, experience design is two wheels on the bicycle. There is the uh, rear wheel, which is, you know, a bike is not going anywhere unless the person can find the pedals, right? So that's where usability comes to the front. You gotta be able to, you know, find that drive shaft and make that bike go. And then there's the front wheel, and that's where player experience comes in. You've gotta master new mechanics. Researchers have new techniques, designers have new methods in order to make that front wheel fun. That's how game design is gonna change what we do, what we do uh, as experienced designers. So player experience, again, to me, this is what it means to me, is how player interaction creates emotion. And that's the main point for the rest of my talk. Because without emotion, really, there is no game. Uh, neuroscience backs me up here in that emotions help people do five things that are vital tasks in games. It helps us focus. There's a reason, ever wonder this? There's a reason why there's a boiling lava monster in Doom, you know, on your iPhone. It's like you're gonna focus on that, right? And likewise, you know, it's gonna help you remember how to deal with them and then decide. For example, this is in Diner Dash when your customers leave, you know, the first time you see how angry they get, you're gonna remember, oh, I better not do that. And it's the emotion that's helping you uh, remember and guide you through that, that experience. So focus, remember, decide, helps you perform and helps you learn. We'll go into more detail about this in my play shop tomorrow. Uh, but, and if we, uh, so what we did was we looked at people at play. People playing at home, school and work, young and old, male and female, uh, playing everything from Tetris to Halo on any platform that they, that they prefer. And these were their favorite games. And what we noticed is that they were doing a whole bunch of different things. But they were experiencing, their favorite moments often had some similarities in emotion. So we did a cluster analysis of those observations. And we noticed that, wow, there was hard fun with frustration and fear. There was this easy fun. Different types of actions were creating curiosity, wonder, and surprise. Different times, at different times. And then there was serious fun. Excitement, relaxation, and value were coming out of those experiences. And then lastly, best for last, is people fun, okay? So we see amusement, Amici, Amiro, uh, admiration, schadenfreude, nachos, wonderful social emotions that uh, were really driving, uh, driving play. And uh, it was the best, the, really interesting, like, well, what, what were the mechanics, you know, behind there? And, you know, I thought, wow, we, we see all these emotions in players. It's like, the question, I just had to ask the question. It's like, well, if we really identified where these emotions came from, really understood, you know, could we create a palette of tool brushes, you know, in a sense, like different actions coming from games that each were connected to a different emotion? And then we could, in a sense, literally paste Velcro onto any screen to grab attention. And the second thing we can do is we could then paint it with the, color it with any emotion that we choose. We could paint it with emotion to match the brand or to match the task at hand. And that's how the four or fun keys work. Uh, it's basically, it's a new approach to uh, interaction design coming from games where we can, uh, you know, go into uh, different, different areas of, um, the, uh, the experience, and then make an adjustment to uh, make, things, uh, make things more fun. This is uh, what the model looks like. Um, this is the one we'll be uh, working with tomorrow. And uh, this is the, the four, four keys to fun. And I, just to have a moment just to take a look at this and uh, see what you think. So there are the four keys, and there are different tasks that are supported uh, for different uh, work environments. So in a sense, at the center was the PX, the player experience, there are the actions. So these are the verbs. Those are the, the handles of the tool brushes, if you will. And then at the outside, on the leaves of the clover, are four different groups of emotion. There is the, uh, at the top we see, there's the hard fun of challenge and mastery. You know, the frustration that leads to, to the feeling of winning. Uh, there's the easy, uh, the easy fun, which is, you know, that's the brass ring. That's the, that's the badge system, I mean, that's the, um, that's the points and the score. The easy fun, is much more about exploration and role play and creativity. And that's the vehicle, this interaction is a vehicle for the imagination. 
in work, you can't, you know, you need both, right? You need to accomplish that feeling of accomplishment, and you also, though, need to problem solve. And then we slip down to the bottom for serious fun, where it's providing meaning and value, and creating excitement through interactions such as repetition and rhythm, and uh, completion and collection. And those create uh, another kinds of other kinds of, uh, of uh, you know, aspiration and obtaining, you know, obtaining value. And then lastly, there's people fun, which is all about social interaction. And I, of course, I'm trying to condense, you know, seven, you know, 18 years of research into two minutes here, but um, and one slide, but. That's the essential relationship in the sense that, you know, if you can then choose your interactions, you can then adjust your emotion profile. So how did we do the research? Well, let's take a look here at a couple players, one player. Uh, so these are three, he's playing Star Wars Galaxies, the tutorial for Star Wars Galaxies. And uh, what do we see on, um, how many people think that there are three, all three images are a player enjoying himself? How many people think all three? Just raise your hand. Okay. All right, some. And then how many people think that, that are, there are two? Two people, two of them are, two of the photos are, are that. Okay, quite a few more, all right. And then how, how many people think only one? Only one is enjoyment. Okay, yeah, back down to the thing. Well, it turns out that it is actually only one. Uh, it's this uh, image here on the far right. And, but it's not because we can see he's contracting his lip because we can see his teeth. It's actually because he's contracting the obicularis ocoli. So for this research, what we did is we identified specific emotions by using Paul Ekman's facial action coding to measure seven emotions in the face, other emotions in the body. Moment to moment, we took those video clips and then tagged them from their emotions. We then sorted those video clips by emotions, and then that's how we, and then from those emotions, we then looked at, well, what were the players doing? And that's how we came out on the, came out on the mechanics. So that's a bit of how we, of how we did, uh, did the research. So let's take a quick tour through the, uh, the uh, four fun keys and uh, see if we can do this in our, uh, in our, in our time together. Uh, uh, there are white papers on our website if you, want, if you want more. My favorite quote, though, my favorite quote in games is this one. Uh, this is a player's uh, wife uh, saying that it's easy to tell what games my husband enjoys the most. If he screams, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it, then I know two things. A, he's going to finish it. And then, B, he's going to buy version two. <laughs> what usability met metric is going to measure that kind of devotion, right? What kind of, that's really twisted. You know, it's like, what's, what's going on there? Well, it turns out he likes hard fun. And in hard fun, it's not simply going to A to B. You can't just push a button and win. Push a button to print, yes, that I like. Push a button and win the Grand Prix. Push a button and my term paper gets written for me. There's definitely something really, really missing. And it turns out to enjoy the process in games, you need some challenge. So it's not just add a point, it's now we need some challenge. We've got to have a clear goal, obstacle. You've got to be able to overcome that with practice over time. You need to fail. A basketball would not, is a fun game because why? Well, the hoop's this small and it's way up there. You know, it wouldn't be a fun game any other way. And so we look at, uh, in the literature, it's very similar to what Csikszentmihalyi had already said with his model of flow. And I highly recommend checking out the model. We have added to it here a lot of other concepts from uh, game design, which we will be doing in my play shop tomorrow. But the important thing is the idea is that, you know, basically you can't uh, play your skill over time. If it doesn't get more difficult, players will leave because they're bored. And then if on the difficulty, on the y-axis, if the game gets too difficult too quickly, then they're going to leave because they're too frustrated. That's the art of game design, balancing player frustration and skill. And what you want, Shiksen Mahai says, is to be in that zone, that white cone in the middle. We noticed some other things in our research. Most importantly is that in order to get uh, one of the most important, the holy grail of game design is that feeling of winning, right? Uh, which we call fiero, since there's no real good word in English. Um, it's that personal triumph of adversity. In order to get that, you have to be, frustrate the player so much. They've got to fail so many times. Failure is good in games, some failure. And they want to be throw that, they want to throw that controller through the window. And at that moment, if they succeed, what happens? Well, they look like this, right? Okay, yes! You know, I just, I just got the boss monster. I just won the Grand Prix. Unfortunately, uh, in the upper right here, she just actually got her character to move, so. That was usability. So it can come out of usability as well. <laughs> um, and so, the, uh, so those are the kind of the basic emotions. So what does it mean for uh, user experience design? Uh, well, we've got 
uh, it's, so it's easy to, hey, let's add points. But be careful what you wish for. Any kind of point system, uh, people will, will gain. It'll change their behavior to maximize their score. So one of the ways that Twitter broke was by putting that big number underneath your name. And everyone plays the follow, you know, follow the leader kind of game, like, well, hey, I follow you, you follow me back, our numbers go up. But then what happens to your RSS feed? You're kind of chasing what uh, Mary Hodder and Kalia uh, Hamlin call their, your personal hype quotient. And that breaks another, that unbalances the game. They've added lists, you know, to kind of mitigate that, but, you know, it's still, um, it's still, pretty, it's still pretty broken. And so what is it you want to think about? Uh, does it, do ideas encourage? Another, another example showing some slightly different things is Mint. So Mint takes some other principles. Uh, in a sense, it simplifies the world, and that's one of the things you have to do for a game. You have to simplify their choices, providing clear goals and to amplify feedback. Now, I don't know how many times you know, bigger those bars are from an average bar chart, but that's like five or six times. I mean, it's pretty clear what this screen is about. And it's amplifying. It's like, woohoo! yes, you had a profitable quarter. And it's, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's almost, you know, in some instances, it's wider than it is, than it is tall. And so that game or toy-like feeling comes from amplifying the feedback and really getting across um, something that's very important for humans, which is mastery. So hard fun is all about challenge and mastery. Uh, it's not about ease of use. It's all about overcoming obstacles. Now, hopefully, these are obstacles in the work environment and not in the tool, like, you know, that, that poor player. But, uh, you know, work, work essentially is hard fun. What makes work feel good, the good part about work, is not just, you know, just slipping them off real easy. What feels good about work is like, yes, you went home and you actually did something. You feel accomplishment by having been frustrated, by having to, you know, apply your, your utmost effort, efforts. So uh, that takes us on to another, another thing. So that's, that's mastery. Let's talk a little bit about easy fun, which is all about be, going beyond the challenge. You can play basketball and not keep score. You can just dribbling the ball feels fun. You can role play the Harlem Globetrotters if you want. That's part of what makes basketball such a, a popular sport. So in addition to challenge that we have here, as any racetrack designer knows, is that adding curves adds more fun. Now, it's not just because it makes it more challenging, the curves. But the curves also create novelty, exploration, you know, this, this new space that you have to then navigate through. So it changes the task up. In fact, in Grand Theft Auto, what we found is that, you know, players on a mission from point A to point B then get offered other things like, oh, plate glass window, freeway exit ramp, parking meter, and like offers in improv theater you know, it's up to the player to decide whether to interact. And what happens is that these moments of interaction on the side through easy fun then enliven the player experience as a whole. It's why I like to think of uh, easy fun as sort of a, a combination between the Wiimote and a uh, fantasy island, you know, as aspirational fantasies, and uh, one of my m most fun games, which is bubble wrap. Okay, it's just fun to do, right? It's just fun. Like anyone who has a Mac here, you know, if you scroll along that dock, woohoo, getting all of those little icons to bounce up and down, you know, that's just, that's just fun. I could be completely happy and entertained for about five minutes. And actually, why don't I? No, no I won't do that now. Uh, so that's, I mean, but that's what, that's what it's all about. It grabs attention and it, and it stimulates us in conjunction with hard fun, so it's slightly different. I like to think of uh, easy fun in another way, which is a Japanese garden. And it makes choices more interesting. You know, they don't have a sidewalk, you know, in a Japanese garden, right? They've got uh, stepping stones. And they're placed just far enough apart so that you have to bring your attention to the here and now, which is exactly what the interaction design of a Japanese garden is, is, is supposed to do. Stepping stones too far apart, you fall through, too close together, you get sidewalk and you'll just run right through the environment. So, Placing these uh, stones creates more interesting choices. How can we see that in games? Well, here um, he's playing Splinter Cell, shot a hole in the fish tank. You can see the water coming out. Look at curiosity on his face. You see it in the eyes and in the mouth. Watch what happens when the level of the water reaches the level of the bullet hole. Okay, do you see that? I'll, I'll do that again. So clearly enjoyment. So we've got a smile going. We definitely have the eyes opening and, and contracting. He enjoyed that. That's not part of the mission. It isn't like, hey, go shoot a hole in the fish tank. It's just there, right? And he does it. Lots of things. The pure joy of interaction, as I said before, really drives a lot of interaction. And you know, so it's whether it's koi pond on the uh, iPhone where you're feeding fish or just tapping the water or shaking the uh, controller for uh, you know, urban spoon to make that come out. It's just the pure sense of going, going forward. And our players tell us that uh, we've got, um, in our game, 
uh, we've got, uh, it's just the, just the idea of tilting. So there are no buttons in the game. All you do is you just tilt the device to play, to move the character, to control gravity and wind. And uh, you want to steer, flip towards, uh, away from the green blight and then towards like the, in this level, uh, white dandelion tufts. So let's take a look at how that works. So there, it was just, just the sheer newness of that interaction was, you know, was interesting, is interesting to, to players. I don't have time to go into a lot of detail here, but you can see it's sort of this novelty, you know, versus the expected. There's this spectrum, and that you're hopping from stepping stone to stepping stone in these, in these unique experiences. In terms of, uh, in terms of software, uh, we've got the mystery egg and farm, how many people have played Farmville? Yeah? Oh, really? Wait a minute. All right, so how many people have played Farmville? Okay, like five of you. No, maybe 10. And how many people have heard of Farmville? How many people are on Facebook? Okay, what games are you playing, if any, on Facebook? All right, ah, okay, okay. Farmville, you should check it out. Um, it's, it's, where, it's what game design is leaving behind, in, but you know, we're going on. But anyway, think about Google, uh, the way that they've done their logo. This is easy fun. This increases curiosity. And if you are a search engine, what's the most important emotion that you need? I mean, there are two, really. But the most important one is curiosity, right? Because if you are curious as the user, as the researcher, and if Google can make you more curious, and you'll actually be able to ease, more easily focus on you know, going through that whole wall of links and reading all that text because you're intensely, oh, I've got to know what happened on Lost this weekend, you know, that kind of feeling. If you could engender that in a search engine, you've got a much more efficient tool. Uh, they've got this I'm feeling lucky button. You know, that's, and, and the humor in here, a little bit more of uh, what we call people fun, but that also engenders some great things that refreshes the task as, as they go. And it creates, you know, imagination. So easy fun inspires in relief, and people will balance the game. Like if they get too frustrated in a racing sim, or they get too frustrated in, be, you know, in, um, in a matching game on, a, you know, in Diner Dash, then they'll go do something fun just, just because. They'll drive the racetrack backwards. You know, they'll put all their sims in the pool and pull out the ladders just to see what happens. Nobody here has done that, right? Nobody has tortured sims. It's like that, that's the thing. Like with, um, you know, with our next thing, uh, we're talking about serious fun. Uh, you know, one of the classic mistakes, if you ever have to do an educational game or try and make your educational site more game-like, the classic mistake is to, is to hand your player a nuclear reactor simulation and then don't let them do what? What would people really want to do? What do you want to do? What's the very first thing? If I did that to you, what would the very first thing you'd want to do? Yeah, core meltdown, right? I was like, oh, the instructor says, no, no, we don't want to teach them how to do core meltdown. It's like, it's a game. Simplify the world, uh, simplify the world, you know, uh, amplify the feedback and suspend the consequences so that you can freely explore and then that will actually, because it's a game, you can actually learn more of that domain than you would ever be able to experience in real life. It's not, games are not just about badges. In fact, James Paul Gee talks about if you can master a simulation, you master the content. And I predict that we will soon have simulations uh, as a standard, you know, SAT format. You know, in addition to multiple choice and, uh, you know, true and false and, and, and those kinds of essay questions. Anyway, so let's, let's move on uh, to uh, serious fun. So it's really, serious fun is this opportunity. It was really strange. We kept seeing this over and over again. It's this really strange thing about this opportunity to change how players um, think, feel, and behave. People at the time, and this is, uh, and again, this was in uh, 2000. Uh, three, 2004, were like, we're, we're playing card games to work out. They were playing Dance Dance Revolution to lose weight. It was really, it was really odd. What were, they, what were they doing? Well, it was because games were, the excitement from games were enhancing an otherwise boring task. So they was, they was getting them something that they already valued, accomplished, in a way that was much more enjoyable. And so that's what these serious and fun mechanics are all about. It's their reward systems that create values before, during, and after plays. It is not just giving a badge. You have to be very careful, you know, if you give badges for stuff. You can actually demotivate folks sometimes if the task is intrinsically um, uh, motivating in and of itself. But stepping back, what I'd like to think of if easy fun is the bubble wrap of game design, serious fun is like the Swiffer. Uh, Slippers, of course, designed by IDEO, one of my favorite product design companies, and 
Uh, you know, you always see this, how, what do we, we always see it like picking up like bright confetti little object thingies, right? Not what I see at home, but we see that. And, you know, for me, I don't know about you, but for me, this looks exactly like Bejeweled, the game of Bejeweled. You know, because why? Well, collect all you can. The goal is collect all you can and enhance your progress and give you that desire to aspire and acquire. There's a reason why there's been a revolution in home vacuuming and equipment. They all have clear canisters. So as you can see, all of the little bugs and whatever get, you know, getting sucked up. It enhances your sense of progress. It enhances your sense of work well done. Jobs don't do this, right? Jobs really don't do this uh, very well at all. You know, it's often, you know, delayed feedback and, you know, the goal's unclear and, you know, we've got this, you know, and if I get any feedback at all, it's, you know, three or four, you know, months later. And right now, but it's like, I want to be the Swiffer. It's like, yeah, I'm getting my work done and boy, it feels good. Nobody here has ever done this, I bet. Nobody here has ever watched their hard drive defragment. <laughs> That's serious fun. In fact, Apple is real genius. They've got all four keys and all of the stuff that, um, that they do. Uh, and uh, by the way, best-selling games, you know, as I said, have all the four keys. Other objects do definitely uh, do uh, apply the keys as well. As well. And in, with Apple, you ever wonder about this? But I thought this was just a stroke of brilliance. Is that's a bejeweled board too? Right? You just, you're basically your mission on the operating, Apple, Apple operating system is to collect as many brightly colored gemstones by using their app store as you can. There's a real delight to that. And that's all serious fun as well. But before we uh, leave serious fun, I think there's one more point that's really important to make. And that is it's not just about the numbers. So it's not just my number going up or the number of badges. It's not just about money either. So work is not, and work is not about money either. Work, you know, in human endeavor really uh, gets better if it's attached to what? If it's attached to something meaningful, right? If it has meaning, if it attaches to my values, if I can express my value or, or get some goal that I really care about. And in our game, players are telling us that um, the, uh, for Tilt is that the environmental theme makes them feel better about their kids playing. The educational value of teaching about recycling or, you know, if alternative energy or, you know, eating oil, you know, that sort of thing, uh, you, it sends a positive message to their kids. And, that, and that's part of the enjoyment. And then the, in the global game, all the tilt points that you earn actually, you know, go up to a global scoreboard and then together we kind of collaborate in a, in a, to push Blight away from the, from the real world, from the entire real world. And there's a real world metagame that we'll be, uh, that we'll be announcing soon. So Sirius Fund's graph look a bit like this. The model looks like this. Uh, we have value creation and time. And uh, what I do with my game design clients and other clients as well, because I've worked with Roxio and Cisco and Oracle, you know, other companies to help them with, you know, uh, improve, uh, improve their user experiences, is that, well, what's happening at 10? What's the reward at 10? What's at 15? What do you want the person to accomplish at 30? At 60, if my company, if, if my client, you know, in the download casual business has not, you know, converted that player like they want to buy, you know, that person's gone. They've lost that customer. So you better believe that that 60 mark, they're paying, that 60 minute mark, they're paying attention to, because that's you've got to have, you've got to have that that player really involved. And then it's not just the, me, but it's me, my friends, my community, my world. This whole spectrum of different layers of value and meaning that's important for people at play. So serious fun can provide meaning uh, and meaningful experiences, which uh, brings us to our last, uh, our last thing, which is what the kinds of interaction that players find the most meaningful, which is people fun. It's friendship because as we all know, I'm sure everyone in the room would agree, is that games are just more fun if you invite friends. Here's a mom and her son playing Wii Boxing. For her, it's this great opportunity to uh, work out a little parent-child aggression. <laughs> And, uh, you know, but, but what's going on here is there's social bonding, you know, through that, through that activity, that they're interacting in a way. And basically, people fun is the excuse to interact with your friends. It's what I like to call, you know, we've, we've gotten bubble wrap and Swiffer, now we're going to mango. Uh, people fun is all about mango for me, and it would be something actually unique for you. And why mango? Well, if my sister says the word mango to me, I'm doing that on the, roll, on the floor rolling laughing thing. And when, and I'm sure you've got someone that can do the exact same thing with a different word, right? Yourselves, right? And why is that? Well, you know, because, well, you had to have been there, or it was a long story. The mango to us is a social token. It's something symbolic in nature, 
that uh, increases in value as it's through use. And as it gets passed between people, back and forth, more emotions build up on it, more excitement, the bonds, it's weaving a social fabric between the participants. My mother would love to know what the word mango means, but my sister and I are not telling, right? No, because that's us. And so these things help grouping and all kinds of fun, of fun things. Uh, objects can be social tokens. In our case, games were. Um, in our game, one of the reasons people you know, shared it you know, 250,000 times was that a lot of it was over the, over the shoulder plate. It's a single player game. But yet they were demoing it to have a discussion. And in fact, again, the brilliance of the Apple platform is that um, if I were to you know, take my you know, iPhone here and, and show, you, you know, show you photos, you know, what you would do is, well, you would take your finger and you would you know, swipe, right? And then you would pinch and zoom, right, like that. Well, now, if you were to do that same gesture on the, the back of my hand, you know, we better be on a date or something. So the social gestures, the gestures you use to interact with the operating system have a social emotion profile. So they baked social emotions into a social device through the types of things that they, um, the types of interactions that they chose to, to support on the platform. And that's why people tell us, petting my iPhone makes me happy. It's also why, a little bit why, uh, there are so many people, plant, and pet games on Facebook. It's because the emotion profile around the interactions matches the context in which they're used. Uh, BJ Fogg talked earlier about pushing, putting hot triggers in front of motivated people. Well, what makes something interesting or fit really well is if, it, if that interaction generates more of the emotion that I was there for in the first place. So if you think about Facebook, and a great example is the like button. I, mean, I, I just liked your status. What does that mean? I liked your status. Well, actually, what it really means is we're primates, and I just picked a digital flea off of you just to say hi, you know, and I like you, and, you know, and then, you know, we reconnect in that very simple way. Uh, and then there's, you know, then you can comment and go on from there. And that's the way you can ex you express your, you know, your Amici or something. Uh, Ocarina is an iPhone game, and uh, you can, or a, a musical instrument you play on your iPhone. You blow into the uh, iPhone, and you can, you can play the flute. And then you can then look at another view, it has a Google Earth-like um, uh, view where you can spin the globe and you can actually listen to people playing that same instrument around the world. And so that sense, that experience, this is experience design, folks. This is not badges, this is not points, it's very kind of game-like. And that experience, then players tell us, it creates this sense of wonder and connection. Uh, Sonic Mule, uh, S. Mule, who uh, developed this app, they're brilliant. Uh, some, another example um, is a Flipboard. How many people have been playing that on their iPads? Yeah, playing with that. Listen to my language, playing with that. Uh, yeah, well, it's a, it's a social media thing. It's just like, wow, the way that the pages flip, that's easy fun. And then the content is serious fun, or it's people fun, because these are all my Twitter streams, right? This is my Twitter and my Facebook, all coming up in this really cool and uh, formatted, magazine format, and it's animated. Uh, like, I just want to make one more point about the people fun is that it does not have to be about, you know, people people. It can be about pets. Tamagotchis or uh, mechanics are very well established. Uh, this is uh, Tilt in a various, uh, this is Flip, the main character for Tilt. And you can see uh, uh, Flip is just that character at iPhone Dev Camp. Um, and then we see an, an intermediate version and then now the version that's in the, in the game that's shipping. And by creating a, something that you care and feed over time, that creates social emotions that can cre cre uh, increase attachment to your game. Or your, um, your your software, uh, and so we've talked a lot about experiences now, and uh, I wanted to sort of wrap up with a couple of closing thoughts, and then show you uh, show you this video, which is all about people fun. So these are folks playing people. Uh, sorry, they're playing uh, Rayman, a mini game in Rayman, on the Wii, and I'm not even including the image of the computer or of the game, because really what's happening is the game designer is not designing the game. Kind of like Shakespeare. Shakespeare designed the emotional space between characters. Game designs design the emotional space between player and game. Watch on the couch. This is what uh, this is what people fun looks like. So it's fun to move together, right? It's fun to dance. So. You're an actor throwing me off. 
A little bit of trash talk. Surprise there. Yeah, what up, my buddy? Yeah. Fear. And so, and, and this, this, this laughter we're having now, that's a social emotion as well, right? Right? And so, and that's what creates, it breaks through. It breaks through something, a cognitive, you can be so in your head and so in that, then that emotion just whoosh, you know. It takes you to another space and it can actually increase the tension. Uh, so people fun, uh, there are more emotions in the people fun quadrant than the other four combined. Uh, here are some of the emotion cycles or chains. You've got uh, player interaction creates amusement, creates social bonding. I talk about social bonding in terms of amiro, uh, to have a nice uh, short word for it. You also have gratitude, generosity, and elevation. But the main point is like interaction and emotion create what we call an emotion profile and that you can actually choose, if you remember the paintbrushes, by choosing the types of choices you put in a user interface. It's not in Facebook, it's not a, uh, you know, the poke button, brilliant. Uh, brilliant, brilliant, because it's really one of the, f it's a fixed word, you know, so, but yet it has a lot of social token emergent qualities to it. Because you poke somebody in the ribs, you know, which you're just being friendly, or are you flirting with me? There's a lot of ambiguity around it. And then it's not, you know, it could have been, you think about it, wink, handshake, decapitate, slap. That's an interaction design. You know, it's just pushing a button, uh, like, like, like. But by, by putting it in that context, changes, dramatically changes, the amount of social emotions that you feel during play. Social emotions from people fun also do some other important things. Uh, we've done a lot of research on the viral distribution, their role in viral distribution. We'll talk a little bit about this in my play shop tomorrow. Uh, and there are also um, other places to get uh, some of the stuff that I've, I've spoken about. But then essentially is that you can actually design by connecting these systems through game mechanics, through mechanics, through choices. You can actually intentionally design viral distribution of your application or of your game. Because social bonds are important. You know, teamwork requires people fun. The, uh, the emotion that people uh, feel when they uh, get, that gets them to share is something that we can actually you know, design in our, in our games. And, and who doesn't want to spend you know, more time with their friends? It's very enjoyable, right? Uh, most of us would rather spend our time you know, around, the, around the water cooler. So in summarizing, I'd like you to think of as games as motivating systems, not badge systems, not point systems. Uh, look to game examples uh, because they innovate and I've been, um, you know, I've been talking about games, you know, since, uh, you know, for the past, you know, uh, 18 years and designing them and they innovate faster. They, they had pie menus, they had voice control way before, com you know, consumer software had them and then they've got more human factors to make a game good, a lot more human factors than just ease of use and they don't think of their players as users. They think of them as players. And that's really important. And not just any player, but hey, I'm playing Diner Dash, I'm a waitress. So that whole user interface is really designed to make me feel more waitressy. Or Sly Cooper, I'm gonna think, feel more like a thief. Or in you know, World of Warcraft, I might wanna feel more like a mage or you know, more like a sorcerer. And they do stuff in the UI to enhance that feeling. So if you can find a, a game allegory to what you've got, put that into your persona profile, you've got some really fun things. Uh, as I mentioned, that interaction design, whether you do it or not, you know, you're, the interactions you design, your designs are speaking this emotional, uh, this emotional language, whether you intend it to or not. You know you need to do fonts, you know you need to do art, you know you need talent and audio. You may not know that your interaction design is also sending an emotional message. And then uh, social emotions, uh, is that that's what drives all of Web 2.0. So in, in fact, what we found is that the, uh, with the four keys, is that uh, we released it in 2004, and in 2005, I gave a talk screaming on top of my lungs, like, game industry, wake up. You need to put a video capture into all of your game software so people can make customer-created videos that you then can host on your websites, and they'll share. This will be, you know, this will be huge, it'll be viral. And um, you know, people were like, yeah, yeah, nice, nice, Nicole. And you know, that was the same month that a URL, youtube.com, was registered. So it was a missed opportunity for many, many, many of my clients. They're catching up, though. Anyway, so now we're talking about uh, player experience design and uh, wrapping it up. And so I'd like you to consider on your next design project how you can choose you know, the appropriate you know, interaction, the appropriate verbs, the appropriate actions to, crea to create the emotions that you, that you want, 
Apple has got a lot of social emotions you know, in their platform, a lot of curiosity, wonder, and surprise as you rotate through the accelerometer. What, we, we built that right into the game mechanic for, for Tilt. So just playing the game created some of the emotions that matched the platform. And uh, the, it's that interaction that, that is what, what creates emotion. And so I'd like you to you know, go back to the beginning and um, think about uh, tw that 2020. And you know, what, would it, what, would it, what would those sort of things feel like? You know, could you paint attention to uh, the UI like Velcro, in a sense, and call it with any emotion that you choose to match your brand or match the task at hand? And I'd like you to, to join me, you know, speak with me afterwards or, you know, in the, uh, on the, in the Twitterverse. Uh, and, and let's collaborate to fill out this, this map because uh, what, we, what we see is that I think we've got this opportunity uh, to do something really special. I think in my vision of 2020 uh, is I see everyone going to work with an expectation of play. Wouldn't that be a nice world? That's my vision. So thank you very much. I'd like to uh, collaborate with you. And uh, if you've got, I don't know if we've got time for questions. I think we might be uh, uh, right on time. If you like uh, posters, uh, there is a top secret URL here, zeodesign.com slash user week, US, uh, I'm sorry, UX week. And uh, you can download the PDF. Uh, and uh, we'll, make it, uh, uh, we'll make it available. It's up there now. And if you want more written book chapters in the following books and their white papers, you can follow me on Twitter. And uh, there's my SlideShare account, and these slides will also be available. So thanks very much. I don't know if we have time for questions, but you've been great. It's been wonderful being here. Thank you.